Welcome to this short introduction to the post-processing for Photoshop and Affinity Photo Pack. The idea behind this kit is to take all of the techniques that I teach in my post-processing for photorealism tutorial and wrap them up in a set of easy to use actions in Photoshop or macros in Affinity Photo. And the benefit of having these functions as macros or actions is twofold. First of all, it means that the processes can be run much more quickly because instead of having to go through a huge number of steps, you can simply click a button and then optionally come back and revise the parameters afterwards. And the other benefit of course is that with a macro, you don't actually have to remember the exact sequence of steps. You can simply click a button and it will do it all for you. And that can also save you time because it means that you don't have to then go and rewatch certain parts of the tutorial if there's a sequence of steps that you can't remember. But of course, this kit isn't just useful for people who've seen the tutorial. It's useful to anyone who wants to add that final bit of polish to their renders. And so the idea behind the post-processing kit is to add some relatively subtle photographic effects to your renders to make them look more photoreal. So I've come back to Photoshop and I'm going to talk very quickly about how the actions are laid out. So the workflow is to start at the top and work your way down. Now I'm not suggesting you need to run every single one of those actions, but if you are going to run more than one, you should start at the top. And in Photoshop, I recommend that you run them in button mode because it just makes it much more convenient. You can run them with one click and also you can see the color coding. So you can see how they're divided into different sections depending on their functionality. So the first three groups of actions, these yellow ones, this orange one, and these blue ones are all designed to work in 32 bit mode on high dynamic range images. And you can ignore these conditional ones in gray here. They're simply extensions of these ones above them in blue. So the image I've got open here is a high dynamic range 32 bit image, and I'm going to show you what some of the effects do. Let's start with a 32 bit glare. So when I run that, what that's going to do is it's going to isolate the brightest parts of the image and add a small glow around them. So as you can see, most of the actions have pop up messages that come up and tell you what's going on and how you can alter the settings. And in this case, the pop up is telling me that once the action has run, I can go to the glare layer and adjust the opacity, or I can double click on the Gaussian blur smart filter and adjust the radius or I can go to the levels adjustment layer and change that. So let's click continue and let the action run. And now if I temporarily disable the glare layer, I can see it's adding a small halo around the headlights, but it's a little bit too subtle for me. And unfortunately it's impossible to make a one size fits all action because each image is going to have different ranges of values. But that's precisely why all of these actions make use of smart objects and smart filters where possible, because that means that once they run, you can always come back and edit the values. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the levels layer and this controls how much of the image is going to be affected by the action. So I'm just going to drag this slider slightly to the left just to include a little bit more of the highlights. And next I'm going to double click on the Gaussian blur smart filter and I'm just going to increase the radius ever so slightly. You can see we're getting a bit of a stronger glare effect. I don't want it to be too strong. Something like that should do. And I'm happy with that. It really gives a sense that the headlights are switched on and there's a very bright light coming from them. And next I'm going to run a bloom on top of the glare and that's going to create a bigger but more diffused glow. So let's run the 32 bloom with options. And in the course of this action, there's a couple of pop-ups that come up giving you instructions on what to do. So I'm just going to click continue and I'm going to set pretty wide bloom radius. I'm going to come back and alter it later once I've got the opacity of the layer under control. So what I want to do now is to reduce strength of the bloom effect and also to soften the transition. And I'm going to explain how to do both. So the first thing to do in order to reduce the strength of the bloom effect is to reduce the opacity of the layer. So I'm going to reduce it to 10% for now. And you can see straight away that's a big improvement. Now, if I select the levels adjustment layer, one thing I can do in order to soften this transition is to change this midway gamma point. You can see as I drag it to the left, the transition gets harder. And as I drag it to the right, it gets softer. You can see that's creating a much more satisfactory effect. And then finally, I can revisit the Gaussian blur smart filter and just increase the radius very slightly just to soften the bloom effect still further. So I'm pretty happy with that, but I do think that at the moment the overall image is a little bit too bright. So I'm going to tone map it before converting it down to 16 bit. So to do that, I'm going to click on this tone map button. And what that's going to do is to add a tone mapping layer at the top of the layer stack. 
And as the pop-up is telling you, you can then alter the opacity of the tone mapping layer in order to control the amount of highlight burn. So I'm going to click continue. Now this tone mapping is too strong for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the opacity of the tone mapping layer to 70, just to bring back some of the brightest highlights. Now, of course, the image does still look a little bit dull, but that's not a problem because what we'll do is once we've converted it down to 16 bit, we can add a filmic curve to really make it pop. And so the next stage is to convert the image down to a low dynamic range format. And there's two ways you can do this with the actions. You can either flatten the image or you can convert it to a smart object first and then convert it. And of course, the benefit of using the smart object approach is that you can then always come back and change any of this processing that we've done so far. You could adjust the tone mapping or change the bloom and glare settings all in 32 bit. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to hit the smart object to 16 bit button and that's going to convert everything to a smart object and then convert the bit depth down from 32 bit to 16 bit. So our document has now been converted down to 16 bit, which in Photoshop is a low dynamic range format. You can see that here, but I've still got access to the original 32 bit document. It's here at the bottom of my layers palette. And if I double click on this layer, it's going to open the smart object up with all of the layers intact, still in 32 bit. So any changes I make here, once saved, will then propagate to the 16 bit document. So now I'm going to do some further processing in 16 bit. I'm going to add a filmic curve to my image. So I'm going to click the action to do that. And once again, a message pops up with some instructions. I'm just going to click continue for now. The filmic curve action creates two new layers. There's the filmic curve itself. And below that, there's also an exposure layer, which allows you to make small tweaks to the exposure below the curve. So I'm just going to increase the exposure just very slightly. And next I'm going to run the unsharp mask wide action. And what that does is just to add a bit of additional local contrast to the image. So I'm just going to continue that and go with the defaults. And once it's run, I'm just going to disable and re-enable the layer just so you can see what it does. It basically just makes the image pop a little bit more. And of course, you can always reduce the opacity of this new layer in order to attenuate the effect, or you can double click on the Unsharp Mask Smart Filter in order to change the settings. And next, I'm going to add a very subtle chromatic aberration to the image. So I'm going to go to the Chromatic Aberration Mild action, and I'm going to run that. And if I zoom right in on the image, you can see that's added a small amount of chromatic aberration around the brightest edges. And the nice thing about this is that it's stronger on the edges of the image and weaker in the middle, just like real chromatic aberration in a real camera. And of course, you still have the option to reduce the opacity of the layer if it's too strong for you. I should also point out that this effect is built by manipulating the individual channels and not by running the lens correction filter because the lens correction filter applies its effect uniformly on the image and doesn't give you the strengthening of the effect of the edges like my method does. So the image is almost done now. I just need to run the final touches. So I'm going to give it a very slight cool grade by running the color balance cool filter. And then finally, I'm going to add a soft light vignette on top of everything. And that's just going to very slightly brighten the center and darken the edges. And my final tweak before calling the image done will be to return to the color balance adjustment layer and just reduce its opacity to 30% just to make the effect that little bit more subtle. Next, I'm going to do a quick demonstration of the workflow in Affinity. The actions are the same in Affinity and Photoshop, and where possible, I've tried to keep them as similar as I could. There are some differences in the way that the two programs record actions, so it's not exactly possible to make them identical. For example, in Affinity, it's not possible to have pop-up messages. The other thing that Affinity doesn't do is it doesn't support smart objects. However, it does have much better support for live filters, so you win some, you lose some. I think overall, actually, the workflow in Affinity is better, but there are some inevitable differences between the two packages. So as before, I've got a high dynamic range document open. So I'm going to add some bloom to it. This time I'm going to run the 32 bit bloom colorful action. So as you can see, that's added a pretty strong optical effect to the image. You can see if I disable and re-enable it, there's a strong and colorful glare around the brightest highlights. There's a couple of things I can do. I can change the opacity of the layer or I can go in, expand this group and adjust the saturation and hue on this HSL layer. So let's see what happens once I swirl that around. You can see that's having quite a dramatic effect on the image and changing the color of this glare. So I'm going to accept that and I'm going to go back to my main bloom layer and I'm just going to reduce the opacity to say 
just to make it slightly more subtle. Now having done that, I'd like to convert down to a low dynamic range format. Now there's a few things I could do. I could tone map before doing this, or I could actually create a tone map layer which is still adjustable in 16 or 8 bit, or I could just flatten the image and go straight to 16 and 8 bit. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep my tone mapping options open by clicking this macro, tone map to 16 bit. So what that has done is that it's converted my image down to 16 bits, and it's also created this tone mapping layer, which I can disable. And underneath it, you can see I've still got the image with the burn in. So what I can do is by controlling the opacity of this tone mapping layer, I can control the amount of burn in my image. And this is obviously adjustable at any time. So I'm gonna reduce this down to 20% to have a much more subtle tone mapping effect. And the next step will be to add the unsharp mask wide to the image, which is just gonna add that extra bit of local contrast to really make the image pop. You can see as I disable and enable it, what effect it has on the layer. And after that, I'm going to add the filmic curve, which just like in the Photoshop version, creates two layers, one with the curve and one with the exposure. I'm going to reduce the opacity of the curve layer because it's a little bit too strong. I just want something slightly more subtle. And because the shadows are getting very dark, I'm also going to run the lift shadows action and then reduce the opacity of the resulting layer down to 50% once again, just to make the effect a bit more subtle. There's also a set of bloom and glare actions that are designed to be run on low dynamic range images. So I'm going to run the bloom action here just to add a little bit more glow to this render. And once again, I'm going to reduce the opacity of the resulting layer down to 50% just so it's that little bit more subtle. And then it's simply a case of adding the finishing touches to the image. So I'm going to run a vignette soft light and a color balance warm just to finish it off. So just to finish off this demonstration, I'm going to show off the noise reduction tools. The first action I'm going to show you is this D speckle. You can see this render has these little speckles. And before I run any noise reduction, the first thing I want to do is get rid of those. So I'm simply going to click the D speckle macro. And if you give it a couple of seconds, you can see they've all gone. And once again, this is completely non-destructive. It creates a new layer on top of the stack. And as I disable the layer, you can see the speckles come back. Next, I'd like to try and get rid of some of the noise in the image. So I'm going to run the denoise medium macro. And while that's better, it's not perfect. So in order to have another pass at it, I'm now going to run the denoise light on top of that. And you can see now the results are pretty good. And once again, it's all non-destructive. You can undo it by simply disabling these layers. And the results you'll get from this denoise macro are similar to the results you would get in the V-Ray denoiser pass. In fact, if you take the trouble to run this on individual render outputs for shading, such as direct shading, indirect shading, reflection shading, and GI shading, you'll get better results with this macro than you would in the V-Ray denoiser. Now all of these macros do work in both Photoshop and Affinity and the results are comparable between the two applications. So I've switched back to Photoshop to demonstrate the Firefly Removal tool. Now this is slightly stronger than the Dispeckle tool and it will work on brighter fireflies than the Dispeckle tool. So let me just show you how it works. You can see this shader has got lots of bright fireflies caused by reflection shading. So all I need to do is to click the Remove Fireflies button and within a couple of seconds, they're completely gone. So I hope you found this video useful and informative. My main motivation for creating these macros and actions is simply to have tools that I would use myself in my day-to-day -day work. And I really do personally find them immensely useful, and I hope that you do too. So thank you for your time.